Okay, well, hello folks. Looks like uh, we're a much smaller group today. Um, I wasn't sure whether or not to cover this chapter because it's uh, it's actually um, starred in the book as an optional chapter, but um, Anton's prepared the material, so um, let's go ahead and do it. Um, it's kind of an interesting chapter actually because it generalizes um, uh, the, the previous elements of the chapter. Um, and shows us kind of a linear logistic progression is um, in a more general form. So uh, Anton, um, whenever you're ready. Uh, hello guys. Um, I think that <laughs> even though we have only three people, but the presentation that I prepared will be very informative. So um, you should be able to I, share your screen now. Yeah, I will start sharing screen. And um, let's open also the presentation. So I want to start from uh, a joke that I read in Polya's book. So then um, a patient came to doctor and doctor said that it has very uh, bad illness that only one person of 10 survived. But then doctor, um said that but you shouldn't worry about this because i had nine patients dead because of this illness so you will be alive for sure um so this joke about probability and its understanding in our life but um so today we will talk about um probability a lot because we didn't cover the chapter of um information theory i decided to include this in today's presentation because the chapter for generalized linear models is just five pages <laughs> and three of them I will cover. And so I decided to use this time to cover also information theory. And today we will uh, talk about the statistics and uh, the characteristics like um, efficiency and biasness and so on. Um, also, I will give the Mm, definition of likelihood function because we talked a lot about likelihood but uh, probably it's good to have definition and then about uh, definition of fissures information and very important um, inequality for effective statistics grammar's row inequality then important factorization theorem about sufficient statistics and um, also to introduce generalized linear model i will first provide an example of standard linear model and uh, how it can be generalized in probabilistic terms and conjugate distributions and exponential families. And um, after that, I will go to the definition of generalized linear models. And uh, also we'll see example how 
the logistic regression can be um, formulated in terms of this uh, family, which is called generalized linear models. And there is also example of uh, Poisson um, regression in the book. I decided that we can read it uh, just by ourselves. Instead, I wanted to introduce the, the usefulness of this probabilistic approach, for example, for automatic model selection. So this is my plan. Let's start. Um, so let's talk about the experiments in general. Uh, we uh, usually have some um, samples from the data. And then we want to figure out the underlying distribution behind this data, behind, but we have only access to the samples. In the statistics, the formalization of this approach is as the follows. We consider random variables, X capital, and random variables. And each result of the measurement, we consider as the sample from this random variable. So I will denote um, the results of our experiment by lowercase x and x capital, um, I will use for random variables behind these samples. But sometimes I will be inconsistent and use capital X for the whole collection of the data in this case it will not be random uh, variables uh, the vector of random variables but it will be the set of uh, ex experiments the samples um, but uh, i believe it will be clear from the context so um, again sample is the vector of n random variables. And realization of this, um, then we use like sampling from, from this sample <laughs> and uh, we will get um, some numbers the, which also sometimes are called samples. And uh, here, here are the examples of two functions of these um, samples. The first function is the mean, the second function is the variance. And um, these are functions of random variables. So they are random variables as well. And we can um, talk about their mean, about the variance, and about other. Um, about probability and uh, so about all the measurements that we can do with random variables. So uh, some important um, characteristics of uh, these functions of uh, random variables, which we call statistic, so statistic is the function of the sample. Um, unbiasedness, which means that the mean of this statistic um, coincides with the mean of one uh, random variable. So um, I denote it by C because um, like x 
1 to xn are just copies of this variable xc. Then consistency. Consistency means that there is the um, convergence uh, of our statistic to its value, mean value. Um, so here I just gave an example of the convergence in probability for uh, mean. Here I used the Chebyshev inequality. By the way, usually people call him Chebyshev, but because uh, I'm from Russia, <laughs> whereas the Chebyshev is from, I can um, assure you that his um, last name is Chebyshev, not Chebyshev, but well, it's not really important. Okay. So um, the mean is unbiased and consistent, while the sampling variance is biased. But if we divide it by not by n but by n minus one, then it will be unbiased as well. Uh, now uh, let's. Uh, think about a distribution with parameter theta. And uh, our goal is to estimate this parameter uh, or a function of this parameter tau of theta. Uh, so we want to find the function of our samples t of x, which um, will uh, give us the unbiased estimator for this parameter or function tau of theta. And suppose we have different estimators, as we had, for example, for variance, one biased and not unbiased, and um, uh, calculate the variance of this statistic t. The statistic with smallest variance is called optimal. Uh, before um, introducing the uh, notion of uh, effic efficiency and um, sufficiency and um, of the statistic. Let's uh, introduce the likelihood function. I didn't uh, tell that when we consider samples usually as the realizations of random variables behind them, uh, we assume that they are independent. What does it mean? It means that the joint probability is the product of probabilities. So if we um, assume that our data comes from a distribution with commutative uh, distribution function f with parameter of theta, and it has um, probability density function p, then we, by the independence, the joint, we can write the joint probability of the entire sample as the product of probabilities. And here I'm using lowercase x's because they, these are deterministic functions, but and this function is called likelihood. But also we can um, like uh, use any um, variables. So we can use X capital random variables as arguments of this function. 
And in this case, this likelihood function will be a random variable. And we can uh, treat it also as a, a random function. But when we talk about a likelihood function, it's a deterministic function where uh, um, X are our data. Now, uh, if we consider this uh, function as a function of random variables, uh, we can um, consider this value, the derivative of log of this function. And because of uh, the product, this equals to the sum of derivatives of log of each um, term of this function. And uh, the variance of this um, V capital is called Fisher's information. Uh, there is another representation using mean. Um, but to prove this, we need to prove that, ex that expectation of V is zero. In this case, this equality will be correct. And I will show it in the next slide. If we consider only one um, term, only one X, which we denote I1, and again, this variable I denote by C because it's only one uh, variable. Then we have the information, the Fisher's information of one sample. And it's easy to see that the Fisher's information is the information of one sample multiplied by the number of samples. That means that if we have large um, number of samples, then we have a, lot, a bigger information. That makes sense, of course. Now, um, because the likelihood function is the probability, the joint probability Sorry, I missed here, Thomas. Is the joint probability of um, our sample, then the integral of it should be equal to one. Uh, now let's take the derivative of uh, this first line. The derivative of one will be zero. Here, I uh, used so-called log derivative trick. Um, I will write here. Um, so if we have function, uh, if we have um, function and that we want to calculate the derivative of this function, I can just write prime as one variable. And um, it will be one over f. Of course, we assume that f is one zero times f prime. And then the derivative will be f times the derivative of logarithm. So, we use it here. And you can see here our function L times the derivative of its logarithm. It's the derivative of this um, expression. And uh, you can see that this is exactly, exactly the 
expectation of the derivative of logarithm, which proves that uh, expectation of V is zero and the previous formula was correct. Um, now, we can also use another representation for information if we do differentiate this expression one more time. If we differentiate one more time, then um, we will get the second derivative uh, for, of the first term. And use again, again, the log derivative trick, we will get the square derivative of the log. And uh, because it's zero, then we have another representation of the information. I recall that information was the expectation of the squared derivative, log derivative. So this term is the information. So it's the same as the negative expectation of the second derivative, or in multidimensional case, it's a matrix expectation of the matrix of the second derivative. Uh, why it's important? It's important because there is a grammar row theorem, which gives the lower boundary on the variance of our statistic t. Statistic is a function um, of our sample. And um, so um, if the estimator t coincides with the lowest bound in this theorem, then this statistics is called effective. But um, you could see um, many assumptions during the uh, explanation of this information and the theory, uh, inequality that um, we can avoid. We can um, use another measurement of quality of our statistics, which is called sufficiency. So um, I will explain why I why I am explaining this because um, in generalized linear models the um, representation of that model includes very uh, important information about sufficient statistics. So. That's why I want to explain what does it mean. And uh, by itself, sufficient statistics are very important because by definition, these are statistics that contains the same information as the entire sample. What does it mean? It means that Instead of transmitting the n data, we can transmit only one function of this data. For example, mean. That, of course, um, probably very important um, if we have a huge amount of data. And uh, this uh, one number, well, it could be a vector, but uh, usually very small because um, the number of the dimension of sufficient statistics is the same as 
the dimension, the dimension of our parameter of theta. So yes, there is also more mathematical definition that probability of X um, is the event from the space A under condition that we have this statistic doesn't depend on parameter theta. That this means exactly that this statistic um, contains the entire information about this x to to estimate parameter theta and there is also important uh, factorization theorem that if our likelihood function can be represented as the product of two functions um, one of our samples x and the other of the statistic and parameter theta, then the statistic t is sufficient. So in other words, contains all the information um, about parameter theta. We will use it. And now uh, just one example, consider the normal distribution if we have n samples then um, so here my abuse of notation as i mentioned i'm using x capital for the data so this is just the set of x1 lowercase and so on um, so likelihood function is the product of the probabilities uh, normal distributions and let's uh, try to um, write it uh, down in in terms of some functions of our sample sets There is the question, how do we know the sample contains no less information without determining the entire population? Um, well, it's probably not um, clear. Um, uh, I explained that uh, this a sufficient statistic contains information not about the entire population but about the parameter of course we first we do an assumption an assumption that our um, population um, distributed um, with so it's about the parametric models so it's distributed uh, according to some um, parametric model with parameter theta. And uh, stat this uh, statistic gives us information only about the parameter theta, not about the population. It's, uh, it answers your question. Yes, of course, we don't know. We can tell information about the population. Um, but it gives us information about the parameter. Um, so uh, let's look at this example. Um, because uh, here this is the product of exponents, exponents but um, we can write as the exponent Component and sum under exponent. Then um, we can add and uh, subtract x bar. X bar is the average value of x. And then we will get um, the sum of this um, 
per psi minus x bar and uh, squared. And x bar minus theta squared, but uh, because there was some, we take them n times. And from this formula, we can see uh, only two functions of our data. So this function, the mean value, um, and this function, uh, x minus mean value. By the uh, factorization theorem, I will remind you that it says that if likelihood can be represented as a function of a function of um, our data, then this function is sufficient statistic. So, according to this theorem. Uh, we can see that in this case, our sufficient statistic is two dimensional. And the first is the mean, and the second is, uh, well, I, 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 I told the difference. We could also use this, uh, the sum without division by n. There is not only one sufficient statistics, uh, sufficient statistic there, there could be several. But um, we can use them as estimators of our parameters, theta one and theta two. Theta one stands for mean and theta two for variance. So this is the example how this factorization theorem is important um, for um, determinant practice. In practice, if this statistic is sufficient or not. Okay, let's look at the example now, absolutely unrelated to the previous part. Uh, two presentations ago, we had. Um, linear regression chapter. Now I just remind you, I want to talk about the probabilistic linear regression. So I will remind you that linear regression means that we have linear function. And there is one assumption which is not required, but if we have this assumption that um, this error term um, distributed um, normally, then we can say that our prediction y also is um, distributed normally with the same variance and with this mean. Um, and also usually we introduce one to cover this bias term to write the uh, linear model just in this uh, simple form. So under this assumption, we have that our y is distributed uh, also normally with this mean, which is the prediction of our model and this variance. And um, here I wrote the just definition of normal distribution with these parameters. Uh, you can see very often, for example, in Bishop's book, um, about machine learning, uh, it's called uh, like image recognition or oh, pattern recognition, I think. Yeah, yeah, pattern recognition. Yeah. 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 Yes, uh, thank you, Pierre. And um, he, he is using the parameter uh, inverse parameter better and also 
squared and um, it, this parameter has uh, its name precision that makes sense that if we have larger bigger variance then precision is small and in terms of precision um, our probability can be written as follows now um, let's write the likelihood function for this um, linear model it's the product just of these normal probabilities and this uh, it's clear that of course um, we want to make the probability higher so to maximize this likelihood we should minimize this term because there is a minus and uh, if we uh, minimize uh, well uh, this term is called sometimes residual sum of squares or sum of squared errors in different books i saw different uh, notations which is of course confused uh, confusing <laughs> and the mean square error is just this um uh, sum of squared error divided by the number of samples and um, it can be written in matrix form i covered it in the chapter seven about um, linear algebra and um, if we differentiate that uh, um, sum of squared errors, we can find so-called maximum likelihood estimator for, ah, okay, here is the, the derivation uh, for uh, parameter W, weights of our linear regression. But it's, it was two presentations ago. Ah. Also, if we assume the normality of our um, error, then we can also plot the confidence intervals and uh, it's easy to prove that this difference is distributed as student distribution. And you can also find the interval estimations on the weights. But what I want to do, I want to estimate, to get the introduced prior information. So let's, and this will lead us to Bayesian linear regression. Um, by the way, if you have questions, you can uh, type or ask them because um, I was preparing this uh, slides and I understand the material and so probably I sometimes go very fast and um, don't cover some details. So feel free to ask. Uh, okay, so we um, introduced prior information on the weights. Um, also, I didn't mention that this model um, so this model this model the uh, probabilistic linear regression is called um, or is from the class of um discriminative models uh, there are generative models when we predict and x and y 
And uh, there is a discriminative model when we predict only y based on x. So we consider x as a given parameter. So we have x point and we want to predict y. Now let's introduce uh, also the information, prior information on our weights, which is given by P of W. And we assume that it will depend on our X or parameter beta in uh, better is the precision. So we write P of W only. And we assume that this prior is uh, just Gaussian with some precision alpha. So then we have this joint model on our uh, prediction y and also on the um, weights. And uh, that will give us not only the point estimate or confidence interval on the weight, but it will give us, if we um, integral, integrate um, through y, it will in give us the distribution on, um, on the uh, w. But before going to the posterior distribution for the weight, uh, let's try to find only its uh, mode. So this is our um, posterior, as I mentioned. So the distribution of W given our data X and Y. It can be written as, um, you remember the con conditional probability. So W Y and we divide by the probability of Y. And because it's, we, we are looking only the maximum, um, the point which uh, gives us maximum um, over omega or uh, over sorry w, w. The denominator doesn't depend on w, so we can just um, look at the numerator. And numerator we will split again using the uh, conditional distribution rule as y of x given w times p of w. And so we will look only at the maximum of this numerator. p of y given x and w is our model. We know this. Um, it's here, normal distribution with mean, our prediction, I, I, I mean, uh, w, x, Precision better. Precision uh, is considered fixed here, but you can also consider model and introduce prior on the precision as well. I just uh, um, use it for simplicity and the estimation on the on mean value. And um, uh, times p prior, and um, we assume the prior information is the normal um, with precision alpha. If we want to minimize, uh, maximize this, then we can minimize only the term under exponent. And this leads us to if we use lambda instead of this fraction alpha over beta, it leads us to rigid regression. So, 
and we can dif differentiate it and find the estimation. This estimation is called maximum posterior estimation. And it's interesting that if you take lambda zero, you will get maximum likelihood estimation. If you will um, lead alpha, lambda or lambda is alpha or better to infinity, then you will get zero. And zero was our prior um, assumption. So it will tend to, to the prior. I remind you the prior was assumed normally distributed with zero mean and alpha as precision. And uh, now, because the product of normal distributions is the normal distribution, uh, this probability, posterior probability on the prior uh, will be normally distributed with some mean and uh, sigma, which are given below. Mean coincides with the maximum, of course, and um, it's the same as our uh, maximum posterior estimator. So I don't look what time is it? Okay. And um, also, what's very important, we can also produce the full Bayesian uh, inference on the new data. Consider we, we are given new X point. We want to predict the target value Y. And we can predict it, but we also have the distribution. And so we can do anything uh, and calculate different. Uh, confidence intervals and uh, this is the importance of probability model for linear regression. Now I can show you the pictures. Um, So on on uh, on the, in practice, it gives us instead of just a standard deviation for linear regression, which is just a um, rectangular around our mean value. It uh, gives you the mean prediction of mean value. Uh, black dots are data. So we have data concentrated only here. And uh, also it gives the estimation of the uncertainty um, around this mean value. Now let's, uh, so it was just an example to introduce generalized linear models. But still, I want to introduce um, the notion of conjugate distributions and also of exponential family. When the question arise, arises, when we can do this full by Bayesian inference. And the answer is when we can calculate the posterior explicitly. So here is a misprint, here should be explicitly. Uh, and the Bayesian inference is possible explicitly only in case of so-called conjugate uh, distributions. What is 
uh, the definition. So I, I remind you that we had W instead of theta. Now I'm using theta as in the beginning. And the posterior estimation of parameter. And it was given by this formula, this fraction. And the problem is to calculate the integral of the numerator in this fraction. And um, P of uh, theta, in our case, given X because this discriminative model, but in general, it, if for generative model, it would be just P of theta. Um, it's called this distribution is from the family F is called um, conjugate to the posterior distribution. So the distribution, um, no, wait a second. Um, and now yeah, it's um, posterior will be um, here. Um, here should be x comma y. I'm sorry, a little bit um, confusing notation. So we have a distribution data given parameter, and we have a prior on parameter from another family of distributions, which depends on its own parameter alpha. And then we cal calculate the posterior of a, this parameter theta given data x. So if the posterior, posterior is given by the first line, lies in the same distribution as prior, but probably with different parameter, then this prior is called conjugate to our um, distribution P of X. So the idea is that the posterior lies in the same class of distribution as prior. And here is an example. If we have a normal distribution with one variant, then um, you can see that uh, we have parabola under exponent. And if we want to get the same class, we should take also the prior as parabola under exponent and it's what? It's again, normal distribution. Uh, so, this is an example that shows that prior conjugate prior for the normal distribution with unknown mean also is the normal distribution. But if we use also unknown variants, there will be different prior. And the table of conjugate priors is in the Wikipedia for every um, distribution, there is its own prime. Now we're going closer to the generalized linear models and let's first introduce exponential family because generalized linear model is a variant of exponential family. Um, so uh, conjugate distributions are easy to find for exponential family. And also uh, that's why um, they are um, known as a, a separate class exponential family distributions. So the exponential family distribution is, you can see the probability is given as exponent. And here is the sum of our parameters times some functions of X. And as you remember for our own factorization theorem, these functions are uh, sufficient statistics. And then some functions dependent only on parameter and only on data, we can write, rewrite them as function of x and function of parameter times and to leave in only the product of 
uh, parameters and um, functions of uh, x under exponent. And um, so you can see all these four notations for exponential class. What is important here that the numerator, I will use, for example, this notation, um, it doesn't depend on x. If we want to find the normalization constant, we should integrate over x. And that means that um, this denominator is nothing else as the normalization constant. It has also other properties, as I mentioned, the um, sufficiency of the statistic u, also the derivative of this function a is gives us mean and so on. And as I mentioned, for this family, it's possible to write the conjugate prior. Conjugate prior should take this form. Okay. Now let's go to generalized linear models, which is the topic for, of today's presentation. Generalized linear models are given by formula 19. You can see that it's very, very similar to the exponential family. In, we just didn't have the um, denominator here. And also it uh, contains a new parameter tau, which is here. Um, but uh, it can be written as general, as um, exponential plus easily. What is important? The importance here is that this parameter of theta is linear prediction. So, in generalized linear models, theta is nothing else as w times x. And it's, you can see, one dimensional. So we don't need the actual transpose here. Um, well, probably faxes. Um, matrix, then we it will be multidimensional. But uh, for our purpose, we can consider it as one dimensional linear prediction. And now let's look at our linear regression. Why I spent so much time on it? Just to give you the intuition and now uh, also to understand better how can we rewrite it in terms of generalized linear models. So our linear regression, you remember, was the normal distribution with mean, this mean prediction, linear uh, prediction, uh, weights times x, and the variance, which is fixed here as well, a constant. So, Let's uh, write the definition of normal distribution and um, rewrite it in the following form. So I will factor out the y squared over two variance, and I will leave the rest here. Here will be twice product, so two um, canceled out and. Uh, Here's the division by this two. And we can see now here, well, um, instead of x, we now have y. Um, we have our linear prediction uh, times y. So this is the first term minus, and the second term is this function a of theta. In our case, it's just the function of that is I mean, W, T, w um, X. 
And if you you can see if you differentiate this function, you will get exactly the um, linear predictor. Um, one more uh, definition we need link function. Link function is that function that um, connects the mean value and linear predictor. I'm sorry, here should be theta, not eta. So, um, because um, sometimes uh, in, instead of theta, books are using function of theta, eta of theta. So there was my confusion. First I wrote as function of theta, then I decided to simplify it just to theta, but I didn't um, write here theta. Oh, uh, and uh, this uh, link function uh, connects our linear predictor and mean value. So in, in case of linear model, um, it's just identity because mu, uh, the expectation of our y given x is here. Expectation is uh, wx. So it's just identity in our case, but it can be different in logistic regression. Let's look at this. In logistic regression, we have again linear model, but you remember we use this sigmoid function, which puts our linear predictor in this weird form and converts uh, the entire line into zero one uh, interval. And um, if probability, for example, larger than one half, we say it's a positive class and if small negative class. Uh, what is the probabilistic model here? Well, there are different probabilistic models, but let's look at uh, generalized linear model first. So it's just a Bernoulli distribution. So head or tail with some probability, um, which is given in our case by sigmoid function of the, here I wrote correctly, the linear prediction of theta. And uh, the inverse function for, for sigmoid will give us the link function in this case. So you can see in this case, link function has um, this form. And uh, let's uh, rewrite this um, model for 24 as a generalized linear model. So we have this probability if y is one, it's uh, our sigmoid. If y is zero, it's one minus sigmoid. It's easy to, to check. And uh, uh, so it can be written, this is the numerator and denominator, the denominator can be written, as I mentioned, as one minus sigmoid, and we take a log to put it under the exponent, and we get exactly the generalized linear model without denominator even. But in practice, we usually use another model for logistic regression. I just wanted to mention this. Um, we can see the variable which takes values one and minus one instead of one and zero. 
And in this case, it's easier to write the probability. Um, and uh, we can also find the maximum likelihood estimate to, to, to take the likelihood function and maximize it. But um, in this case, there is no um, in implicit or sorry, explicit form, and we need to use optimization. But but the nice thing about all these models, about generalized linear models, about exponential families, that if we take the log of this function, you will have this parameter of theta um, as linear function because log of x will be just the linear function. And um, log is the um, convex function by itself. So um, all these models are convex functions and it's easy to um, to optimize them. They have only <clears throat> one um, extremum. So this is a maximum length. What if we want to introduce prior? Then we will get um, here the joint model. Okay, I have 12 minutes. I have just two slides left, so I will finish in five minutes, I hope. Uh, so um, if we introduce prior for logistic regression, it is not conjugate prior in this case, unfortunately. Uh, again, uh, the normal distribution, but with diagonal my matrix. Um, so for each weight W, we have its own uh, precision alpha. But um, to find the maximum posterior, we can use so-called Laplace approximation. So Laplace approximation means that we um, just expand uh, this expression using Taylor formula up to the second order. And um, because in the maximum point, uh, the first derivative is zero, we have also only the first term and the second and the, the second order term, and um, this term is easy to um, figure out. So, and this is called Laplace approximation for. Um, evaluation of evidence. Well, I also didn't mention that we want um, to optimize our parameters using the um, evidence um, as the uh, uh, how to say it, as the principle of the optimality. I think I yeah I mentioned this in when when we were discussing chapter three about probability, the evidence estimation as the model selection principle. And if we 
uh, optimize this evidence, then we can uh, find the iteration procedure to calculate these parameters alpha. And I want to show you how it works in practice because it's interesting. So I took the noisy moon data set and um, what I do next, I put, um, I want to do the logistic regression. I put on each point, uh, the so-called um, radial uh, RBF, radial um, basis function, which is just um, exponent concentrated at each, at, at this point. And um, let's look and take as features these, um, how many points I have, 201. So, and take as features these 201 um, kernels. So here you can see black dots are the dots which I'm using for my model. And uh, we can do a simple, Newton method for maximum likelihood estimation, and we will get this result. And now I will introduce the prior. So I will use this iteration method for this prime matrix A. And introduce this prior, um, and then initial values. Now let's calculate. It will take some time. Let's do small number iterations. Because in uh, case of logistic regression, we don't have the um, explicit forms, so we use numerical methods. And uh, now you will see that some precisions alpha will go Well, here you just uh, not precision, but inverse, I think, will go to infinity. And uh, for example, let's see this one. I just took one of the 201 parameters. We can look also to other parameter. Oh, you can see that this parameter went down. And then, what does this automatic selection um, method? It um, we use only that weights for which this um, prior are small. And now let's look at the. Uh, result. So as a result, you can see much smaller data points, which, so it, may, it means that instead of 2001 weights, we are using this amount of weights. And the prediction also is not so abrupt as in case of, as in case of just simple, Logistic regression. 
with um, two hundred and one features. Um, so I just wanted to share with you this because I think it's full methods um, which uh, are available available if we're using probabilistic methods. Okay, and that's it from me for today. Uh, as I say, mentioned, um, the general this linear generalized models just use the linear predictors and another model is Poisson regression you can read about this in book i will not cover it in the interest of time i think i covered more interesting things yes thank you um thank you very much anton um that was uh that was actually very interesting and thank you also for um covering some of the material from chapter six that we never got to uh to cover on information theory um so we're, we're almost out of time so we don't really have a lot of time for questions um if anybody has any quick questions um, ah there is a question in chat that i didn't see um what is the benefit of using maximum likelihood estimate um well um uh, as you remember the the likelihood function is the joint probability of data and uh, we want to maximize this probability so this is just the general approach that uh, is called maximum likelihood um, estimation. So what is the benefit? Um, uh, just probably because there is no better approach <laughs> to, to maximize, to, to find the parameter than maximization of the joint probability. Are you happy? I, I, are you happy to share this collab notebooks? Well, you could see that there is a mess in the code, and um, so I wouldn't uh, like to share the or any time to clean it out. Okay, that, that's fair enough. Um, so we're we're almost out of time, and the recording is going to stop uh, momentarily. But if somebody is, uh, I'm sorry for interrupting, but if somebody is interested, you can just write me and we can zoom and I can probably explain you. And also you can write all this code from the formulas that I provided today. Yeah, so and, I, and the, the video and the slides will be posted um, as, as usual. Um, I must say at one point you showed us um, uh, a screen of a, I think it was a Russian text. Um, <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, and, and when, I, when I saw that, um, it made the math look a lot easier because <laughs> um, I didn't did understand. It made the mathematics of the slides um, seem a lot easier <laughs> because uh, well, I didn't, because I didn't understand any of the Russian. <laughs> so, so all yeah. of a sudden, all of a sudden, the math became much easier. <laughs> yeah, but for for preparation, I was using mostly Russian textbooks. Yeah. Well, just to mention that Komagorov's books are in Russian. <laughs> so <laughs> I found um, that they are like very more informative than most of the um, yeah. English uh, textbooks, except of course of features, uh, which is the cave store. Yeah. yeah, there's um there's a number of books that are freely available as as PDFs also, there's a, a very famous one, I think called Statistical Machine Learning um, that I imagine uh, uh, yeah. covers a lot of the material in this book. Okay, so this, um, this actually wraps up section two of Kevin Murphy's book. Um, and next week we will be starting on um, section three, which is uh, neural networks. So the, the, the deep learning portion of the book. So um, thank you again, Anton, for a really wonderful presentation.
And uh, thank you for taking the time to prepare so many uh, of the chapters of the book. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. <laughs> I, I yeah, hope I gave you the flavor of the probabilistic machine gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I am. Um, I need to send you an email because uh, it turns out that two two years ago um, I worked for Peter Norvig on his uh, Google Summer of Code project, and I I mentored um, a PhD student at the University of Rochester. Um, who's probably still there. So I'll, I'll send you an email with his name, but you probably you. you probably know him. So. I'm not sure because I'm an electrical engineer and, and I think oh, I see he could be in computer science. Yes, he's definitely in computer science. We are in the same building, but different departments. Okay, different floors, okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you again. And uh, everybody have a wonderful evening or, or day and uh, we'll meet back here next week. All right. Have a nice All right. Goodbye.